As a journalist who's made it my mission to help you and I understand how to age well, there are some standout habits picked up from the experts I talk to and from scientific studies that do seem to really make a difference. And in this episode, I'm going to round up 10 that I personally prioritise, including some less discussed but important habits that can have a transformative effect. The first potentially lifespan changing habit is one of the most important of all, and it's quite simply to eat more fibre. It's a big theme of next week's episode where I'm talking to a leading expert on the gut microbiome, Professor Alan Walker of the Rowett Institute, who explains exactly why this is the greatest thing we can do for our gut health, but it also has much wider health implications. And once you have it hard set in your mind to lead with fibre in your diet, you'll make sure there's plenty of it present in every meal. How much we need and can easily digest will vary from person to person. So the best evidence lies with trying to eat as big a variety of plants in their most natural form that's comfortable for us. So that includes fruit and vegetables, plus whole grains, beans, lentils, and so on. But let your gut guide you as to what does and doesn't agree with you. Fiber not only feeds some of the helpful gut microbes that make sure we extract nutrients efficiently and much more, but higher fibre diets can also reduce inflammation and the risk of conditions like inflammatory bowel disease and also heart disease, stroke, hypertension, obesity, type 2 diabetes and some cancers. Fibre intake recommendations from the Institute of Medicine range from 19 grams to 38 grams a day, depending on gender and age. But with the vast majority of people in countries like the US and UK, falling well short of that target. So adding more fibre to your diet is one of the very best habits you can get into to support your health and longevity. Second on my list, and also something that should be a huge priority as we age, is to lift heavy things. If you haven't already, I really recommend you watch my interview with physical therapist and strength trainer Chris Reese. I'm going to link it below because he made the case for doing whole body workouts with weights and barbells in particular to maintain and increase our strength as we age. We talked about one of his clients, Merce Hershey, who came to the gym at 95 years of age in a frail condition after a fall and who's actually managed to increase the bone density in her spine through strength training. And for any of us who want to stay mobile and independent into our later years, this has to be a big focus. It's never too late to start lifting weights and workouts can be adapted to factor in injuries or problematic areas, but you can build muscle and even bone at any age. And there's growing consensus among the scientific and medical community that muscle is the organ of longevity, with loss of muscle mass as we age, one of the greatest contributors to age-related disease, physical and mental decline. Here's a few ways in which this is true. Increasing muscle mass improves bone health and prevents breaks, which are such a huge cause of decline in old age. Muscle mass is important for metabolic health because it helps regulate blood sugar levels and stores glucose, helping prevent type 2 diabetes and other health issues. A study involving more than 900 older people found that for every one point increase in muscle strength, the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease dropped by 43%. So strength is vital as we age. The third healthy habit is to move more and particularly after eating a meal. We know that keeping active is important as we age because it's been linked with better heart and wider health and mobility. But there are particular benefits to being active after eating rather than making straight for the couch. Research increasingly points to being active after a meal, improving our digestion, as well as lowering sugar spikes as we age, which left unchecked, can lead to type 2 diabetes. A 2016 study in people with type 2 diabetes found that walking for 10 minutes after every meal was more effective for controlling blood sugar than walking just one time a day at any time, but for 30 minutes. So this is a simple change that could make a big difference. Fourth on the list of healthy habits to adopt as we get older is eating plenty of protein because it's vital for building and maintaining that all important muscle mass. It's something that some of us, including me, have to put quite a bit of thought into, particularly if you're vegetarian or vegan. 
I'm not someone who really enjoys eating meat unless it's smothered in a sauce. So I really have to try to eat enough protein and I'm trying to source it from as many different natural sources as I possibly can through eating more nuts, fish, unprocessed meats, dairy, beans, pulses, so on. But I have a very simple protein powder that I use as well just a few times a week and I'll add it to things like smoothies because it's unsweetened and unflavoured and basically just pea protein. So I'll link to that below if you're looking for a powder like that that doesn't have a lot of additives in there. A common recommendation from health officials is that we eat at least 0.75 grams of protein a day per kilo of body weight, but a lot of nutritionists and scientists are now saying we should consider increasing that to at least a gram per kilo of body weight or even higher depending on how physically active you are. And older adults may have a less efficient ability to synthesize protein from the food they eat, requiring a higher intake to achieve the same muscle building effects. Fifth on my list of healthy habits is something that is a challenge for many of us, including me, and that's managing stress. We know stress is a killer. It contributes to inflammation, which in turn affects every aspect of our health, harming cell and tissue function. It can even damage our DNA and reduce its ability to repair itself. And one of the biggest causes of stress in modern life is overwhelm in an always on culture, trying to control the uncontrollable. Our heads are constantly full of information and we're often looking towards the future and what problems may arise in it, rather than just being in the here and now. So there are two changes that have helped me. Firstly, just creating a to-do list. So rather than allowing tasks to build up in my mind and become overwhelming, I note them down on a page that's always open on my laptop and I'll allocate a day to do them. That in itself massively helps reduce anxiety for me. The second thing has been a change in mindset to start believing that life is happening for me and not to me or against me. That belief alone means I've stopped catastrophizing in the way I used to. I try to see problems now as something to learn from and while I may not immediately see their purpose, I do choose to believe that it's meant to be because that, at the end of the day, is the best belief for my mental health. Adding to that sentiment is my sixth habit, and that's being aware of your breathing and using breath as a scientifically proven way of calming yourself down. Slow, deep breathing can lower blood pressure and heart rate, while rapid breathing can increase both. Controlled breathing has been shown to reduce stress hormones in the blood, improve mood and alertness, and even improve muscle and immune system function possibly by improving blood flow and the delivery of nutrients and oxygen to our cells and muscles. So whether you call it meditation or you just take time to consciously slow down your breathing at different points in the day, and particularly if you're feeling stressed, you will feel it calm you and you will feel a benefit from doing it. The seventh habit is to prioritize sleep. Our bodies need to spend time in repair mode overnight to support our brain health, immunity and other critical functions. Although the ideal amount can vary from person to person, for most of us it's generally recommended that we try to get at least seven hours sleep every night. Now I'm not going to run through the list of health problems that have been linked with a lack of sleep because that just creates stress for those of us who find it difficult to get enough of it in the first place. But we all know what it feels like to lie awake at night worrying about not sleeping. Personally, where I've found it harder to get to sleep or where I wake in the night and then I can't get back to sleep, slowing my breathing just like I've been speaking about, taking that right down is really helpful and often that alone sends me back to sleep if I stick with it. And if that's not enough, then I'll listen to white noise or a podcast like this one. And my kids will vouch that just me talking is enough to send anyone to sleep. But there are also supplements that people swear by for sleep, including magnesium, which I personally feel has helped my sleep and stops me getting headaches as well, which were becoming really frequent at one point. But rather than getting into the whole area of sleep today, I'm going to dig around to find a good expert for a future episode who can talk us through some of the best proven sleep supporting supplements and lifestyle changes we can make because this is a big topic to explore and sleep is just so important. Healthy habit number eight is making sure you get out in daylight within the first few hours of waking. 
That's because getting into daylight as soon as you can has been found to be important for helping regulate your circadian clock so you can sleep better, which in turn supports your immune system and overall health. But there are other proven benefits too, including being a powerful mood booster and improving daytime alertness. So on a sunny morning, getting outside for just five to 10 minutes is considered beneficial. And on overcast days, and we get a lot of those in Scotland, let me tell you, experts say we're looking at around 15 to 20 minutes in daylight. Consciously taking in daylight early in the day is gonna help a lot in winter if you live somewhere like me where there's significantly fewer hours of daylight. And it's also a time of year, unless you're in a sunny climate, when it's a particularly good idea to take a vitamin D supplement if you're not already. I take a higher dose one every other day, all year round, which also includes uh, vitamin K2, and magnesium and you can very cheaply test your vitamin D levels these days with home kits to make sure your levels are optimal where we want them to be but not too high and also not too low obviously. Moving on to number nine, over the last year I've become a real fan of heat therapy. Specifically I use the sauna at my gym twice a week and I top up with a heat therapy blanket at home as well. I filmed an episode dedicated to heat therapy which includes a review of the higher dose infrared heat blanket which is the one I use so I'll share that in the description for those who might be interested in more detail but in a nutshell Heat raises our core temperature, activating what are called our thermoregulating pathways through the hypothalamus in the brain, which controls our hormone system. That leads to an increase in our heart rate, causes our blood vessels to dilate and sends our sweat glands into action. And this has multiple physical effects similar to exercise, including improving cardiovascular fitness and function, lowering blood pressure and helping us regulate blood sugar levels by increasing insulin sensitivity. But sauna therapy also causes us to release heat shock proteins. Now, we know that damaged proteins speed up the aging process, and so we want to do as much as possible to repair them and help make replacements. And heat shock proteins can help the body do exactly that and prevent a buildup of damaged proteins that accelerate aging symptoms and instead activate repair to slow down the aging process. Heat also increases the production of endorphins which help improve our mood and support better sleep and these are just some of the benefits. And don't forget you're releasing heat shock proteins in the skin too which have been shown to support collagen production and I'm convinced it helps the condition of my skin. I top up on those heat shock proteins in my skin by using the Nera laser device every other day which feels like just the right frequency for me to get the reduced wrinkling benefits without drying out my skin. And again, I'll link to more information on that in the description. Finally, if like me, you have a sweet tooth and find yourself regularly tempted, then how about some healthy swaps? Fruit's an obvious one because although it's sweet, it does have that all important fiber and is a source of nutrients too. So if I'm craving ice cream on a weeknight, because I do allow myself a treat on the weekend, I'll eat something like frozen cherries instead, which give me that burst of cold sweetness, but are nutritious too. And if you're a chocolate addict, try eating higher percentage dark chocolate, which is very likely to have a lot less sugar in it than milk chocolate and also contains minerals and flavanols. If you go high enough in percentage with the dark chocolate, the bitter taste alone is enough to dampen anyone's appetite. I'll also eat frozen peas as a snack sometimes and it's a way of upping my protein while taking the edge off cravings for unhealthy snacks. So just getting creative by choosing natural snacks that have a nutritional value to them is the way to go when it comes to getting over bad food habits, staying away from the processed stuff as much as possible or reserving it for more of a treat. And of course, a big win is swapping sweetened drinks for water wherever you can. So those are my own personal healthy habits I think have served me best. I still enjoy a dessert at the weekends and I still probably eat more sugary treats than I should, but I also don't believe we have to be all out hardened biohackers with very regimented routines and super strict diets to live well for longer because it is important to enjoy life. But these changes 
are steps in the right direction. As always, I do love to hear what you think and what your healthy habits are or whether you're working on developing some right now. Let me know. And you can find more advice and information from me on my website, honest.scott. And you'll find a link in the description where you can sign up to my free monthly newsletter where I round up all my latest content so you don't miss a thing. You can listen to The Honest Channel now on the go on YouTube Music, Apple Podcasts and Spotify. They're all linked below. And if you enjoy my content, then you can help this channel and podcast grow and attract the best experts to help educate us by hitting subscribe or follow. But for now, thank you so much for being here today and I'll see you next time.